I've um, called my talk from glowing grubs to superbugs, but a kind of alternative talk is um, or title would be our adventures in crowdfunding because I'm going to cover that quite a bit. Um, but if we start with the glowing grubs part of my talk, um, so I want to tell you about one of my favorite microorganisms, um, which is, can be visualized here in the very bright green bit. So this is a picture of um, a microscopic nematode. Uh, and the green bit, the really bright green bit, is a bacteria that lives inside that nematode's gut um, called Photorhabdus luminescens. And I just, I, oh, I love these organisms because they're a, an amazing, um, an amazing partnership. I think it's one of these really cool stories to tell children and get them interested in, in both microbiology and, and insects. So what, what this um, nematode does is it's basically a, a pathogen of um, various larvae of various uh, insects. And so what it does is when it comes across something like a caterpillar, it, uh, so they live in the soil, I guess is the first place to start. And when it um, comes across a caterpillar, it burrows its way inside of that caterpillar. And then once it's inside, it vomits up this bacteria, this photorhabdus, um, which start to produce toxins um, that kill that little caterpillar. And then it forms this amazing, I guess, a little micro kind of environment where um, you get this intact caterpillar, dead caterpillar uh, with uh, the bacteria in it. Um, the worms start to uh, reproduce and do what worms do. Uh, and then essentially uh, kind of spill out of this uh, little dead carcass um, when they're ready, looking for a new, um, a new caterpillar. But there's a couple of really interesting features about this partnership, um, especially the, the bacterial side of it. So there's, I guess one of the things to say is that there's lots of different um, types of this symbiosis. So there's, there's different species of nematode and different species of bacteria. Um, but the one that specifically the, uh, the um, photorhabdus luminescens, this bacteria, uh, what you end up with is these little, um, little insect cadavers that basically glow in the dark because this bacteria, for some reason we don't know yet, um, produces light. And so one of the hypotheses that's been put forward is that perhaps this um, stops earthworms from burrowing uh, it's sort of into these um, dead caterpillars in the soil. I actually know how earthworms have got like light sensors on the head. So because it's really important for the um, nematode that this, this little cadaver stays intact, perhaps this is a way of kind of getting the um, earthworms and things to go uh, around them. Um, so you end up with these little things going in the dark. Um, but another really cool thing about them is that this bacteria also produces antibiotics. Uh, and so I guess that's to sort of you know, keep that environment um, from being taken over by other bacteria. Uh, and and um, one of the really cool things about that is that, um, so it, it obviously, you know, protects the, the that, um, that little nematode and various things. Um, but there's apparently reports, and I can't quite remember which war they're from, but there's reports of uh, soldiers that basically had um, glowing wounds and they called them angels glow because they um, noted that these soldiers were much more likely to survive their wounds if they glowed than if they didn't. And so what I really kind of love as a microbiologist is that this has been given a sort of, um, you know, sort of supernatural name. But what's probably likely to have happened to those soldiers is that their wounds became contaminated with this photorhabdus. Um, and it produced antibiotics uh, and stopped other really nasty bacteria from taking hold um, in those soldiers' wounds, and so they survived. So um, I think that's just a really kind of cool, this was several hundred years ago, um, I think that's just a really kind of cool example of um, an amazing partnership uh, and I guess a kind of an unexpected um, uh, use of bioluminescence maybe <laughs> um, but anyway so that's kind of one of my um, where we start with the sort of glowing uh, grubs bit um, and I'm just really uh, fascinated I guess by um, these kind of creatures that glow uh, and how they do it and I've been fascinated by that since kind of being a kid um, and what I never really expected was to be able to use that or to be able to combine that fascination um, and sort of make it part of my job I guess. So that's kind of where I want to talk about how we use bioluminescence in um, my lab. So the really cool thing about that, um, the bioluminescence made by this bacteria uh, is that it's essentially a chemical reaction. 
there are lots and lots of bacteria that glow, but the vast majority of them are found in the sea. Um, so this is, I think, one of the only ones that's ever been found in a terrestrial environment. But they essentially all have more or less the same kind of chemical reaction that they do. So this slide here shows you the chemical reaction, but it also shows you the genes that are involved. So there's five genes um, involved in this. They're called the Lux operon. Um, Lux A and B make the luciferase enzyme that basically catalyzes the reaction. Um, and what it does is it turns an aldehyde into a fatty acid, um, producing light as a byproduct. And there's a couple of really important things about this. So it requires oxygen, um, and it also requires um, FMNH2 from the electron transport chain. So essentially, only kind of living bacteria will glow. Uh, then there's another three genes involved, like C, D, and E. And these essentially recycle the fatty acid back into aldehyde. So they make this big um, fatty acid reductase complex. Um, and essentially, if we take all of these genes and we put them into other bacteria, then we can kind of also make them glow in the dark as well. And so this is just sort of showing you what they look like. So when we have these cultures um, just in the light, they just look like normal bacterial cultures. But if we turn off the lights, then you get this amazing um, blue glow. And I can't imagine what this must have looked like um, for those soldiers with their kind of, you know, their wounds um, kind of making this kind of eerie blue light. But um, I guess if it helped them survive, then probably a good thing. Anyway, OK, so the really cool thing basically about this um, chemical reaction, as I said, that um, only bacteria that are alive will glow. So we can kind of use it as um, a marker for whether they're dead or alive. Uh, but also, um, basically, the more bacteria there are, the brighter the light will be. So we can essentially use light to um, count the number of live bacteria that there are. So I kind of liken this to like the lazy microbiologist way to do microbiology because rather than taking a sample and plating it out and you know waiting for the bacteria to grow on plates and then counting colonies, we can just put our samples in a luminometer, press the button, and then basically get a reading. Um, and we get that reading really, really quickly. Uh, and we don't have to destroy the sample in any way, right? So we can actually look at, um, look at a sample kind of multiple times uh, and get that measure really, really quickly of whether there are bac bacteria um, in there. Uh, and one of the reasons I sort of started doing this was because um, one of my very first projects was working on mycobacteria. Um, so that includes the bacteria that causes tuberculosis. And they grow really, really, really slowly. So they take like six weeks to form colonies on a, on a Petri dish. And so this is a much quicker way of finding out where the bacteria are, how many there are, are they kind of dead or alive. So the project that I want to sort of start talking about is um, how we are using these uh, bacteria that we've engineered to glow to basically look for new antibiotics. And um, like, so telling you about the whole need for new antibiotics is sort of a, a, a whole talk in its own. But essentially, you know, we're running out of these amazing medicines, um, the bacteria are becoming resistant to them. And for some bacteria, there's almost nothing left to use anymore. So there's um, big efforts all around the world to try and find new antibiotics. And the place that we're looking is a collection of fungi um, that's basically stored right here in Auckland. Uh, there's about 10 or 11,000 fungi in this collection. Um, it's called the International Collection of uh, Microbes from Plants. And it's uh, held by one of our Crown Research Institutes called Manaki Fenua. So essentially, we have this collaboration with them where, um, so Bevan Weir, who's the mycologist and the curator of this collection, um, he basically selects fungi for us. They come to our lab. We uh, grow them. Uh, we pit them against our glowing bacteria. If the lights go out, then that says to us that the fungi is producing something that is um, killing that bacteria. So we will then... Uh, We'll do a few things, but in the olden days, we used to just grow up huge amounts of that particular fungus, make an extract, and then basically send it over to our chemistry colleagues and basically ask them to try and identify what compounds that um, uh, that fungus is producing. So one of the reasons we've chosen fungi is because one of the very first um, antibiotics that was ever discovered, penicillin, comes from a fungus. Um, and New Zealand has you know plants and animals that are found 
nowhere else in the world. So the theory is that perhaps um, our native fungi, um, some of which are not found anywhere else, perhaps they're making some novel chemistry that hasn't been seen before. Um, and so the hope is that we don't just find penicillin over and over again, and we most definitely haven't. So that's a good thing. Um, so, yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about basically how we've managed to get this um, project going, because for any of you who have uh, worked in research, um, you might be familiar with this uh, PhD comics um, little comic about the grant cycle. So basically, you're supposed to write a grant, get your money, do your research, publish your results uh, and rinse and repeat. Um, I quite like the, how it really works is that you kind of do your research, you get your results, but you don't publish them. Uh, you write your grant to do what you've already done that gives you the money to then kind of go off and do something else. Um, and so because the grant, I guess, funding um, success rates are so low, um, some of us just kind of get stuck in that right grants bit where you basically don't really have any money <laughs> to do anything because you can't get any money. Um, so for a long time, we were sort of stuck in that place where we were trying to, we were writing lots of grants to say we really want to, you know, look for these new antibiotics. Um, but it just wasn't exciting enough, I guess. It didn't use AI or it didn't uh, it didn't do something, you know, it was just we want to just look at these 10,000 fungi. Um, so we got stuck for, for many years um, without any money. And then we uh, basically I submitted an application to a charity called Cure Kids. Uh, and it just so happens that one of Cure Kids um, ambassadors is a, a little girl. Well, actually, she was little then. She's a teenager now um, called Eva. And she was born with a hole in her diaphragm and had lots and lots of operations as a child um, and ends up getting Staph aureus infections quite frequently. Um, and so she's really struggled with um, MRSA, so methicillin resistant Staph aureus infections. Uh, and I think had probably just had another period in hospital and had another infection. And so our application appeared saying we want to find, um, you know, new antibiotics that kill Staph aureus. And they said, yes, we want you to help save Eva. And so we got a little bit of money from them. And it's kind of amazing how that sort of just helped us, um, you know, get started with this project. So I call this sort of phase one of the project, the lean years. So this is when uh, those Cure Kids funds are really tiny. So it's just $50,000, which was basically enough money to, to um, pay the wages of uh, half a technician, which was um, Benedict, uh, and gave us some consumables to support some um, master's students. So that's, uh, that's kind of what we did in those first few years. And that really was just about getting that um, that essay up and running, so getting the fungi out, um, figuring out as a person who doesn't work with fungi, how do you work with fungi, um, and setting up our screening with a whole bunch of different um, clinically relevant organisms. So Staph aureus, E. coli, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, and sort of my kind of uh, one of my loves, the, the mycobacteria that cause some of these really nasty um, uh, skin and top, soft tissue infections, and then also obviously the one that causes tuberculosis. So we started that screening um, and it became clear very soon that uh, that kind of 50,000 a year wasn't really going to get us very far. Like we could certainly find things that had activity, but, you know, doing anything else with them was a little bit difficult. So our next phase was basically to start doing some crowdfunding. Uh, and so we so Cure Kids actually came to me and said, you know, we've heard about people doing um, crowdfunding for um for you know, research, um, we'd like to try this. And they thought, because I had a quite a high public profile already and was doing kind of science communication, that maybe this project was a kind of good one to start with. So they um, have an association with a company called Briscoe's. And so they kind of work with Briscoe's doing all these things in, uh, you know, in, in stores, getting people to donate. Um, we got people to sponsor a fungus and basically said, you know, we'd um, allocate you one from our collection uh, and then basically, you know, let you know how our, um, how our screening went. Um, and then they just did this big push kind of on, um, you know, by the media, um, essentially trying to raise uh, $250,000 um, to kind of get us, uh, you know, uh, a sort of a, a big, <laughs> a big amount of money so we could actually do some stuff. Um, and 
they so we were we were successful um but one of the really amazing things was when i was talking about this crowdfunding campaign um on the radio one day uh, somebody heard me talking about it and basically got in touch um and donated a hundred thousand dollars towards that campaign and that was um, new zealand carbon farming so that was really great and kind of got us over the line uh, and we basically raised, so in total, actually 280,000. And that was essentially enough for um, our, to hire Melissa as our postdoc, um, to hire a technician, uh, and then to support our um, students. Uh, so we had a master student and then Daniel who came on and did a PhD. And essentially that year we made really good progress taking some of those hits that we'd had in our kind of lean years and starting to identify uh, chemical compounds. Uh, but we also widened our screening a little bit. We um, picked up another bacteria, Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is uh, super important. Um, started looking at things like, um, can we get the, can we add things to the media to get the um, fungi to change what they're, what chemicals they're producing? And then also, what Daniel was really interested in was growing the fungi in liquid media with our bacteria. So kind of getting them to stimulate the fungi to potentially produce different compounds. So that was 2018. Um, we had like money for a year and we uh, started writing more grants now that we had sort of preliminary data. Um, but still nobody was really interested in funding this project. Um, so we went back to um, uh, New Zealand Carbon Farming and said, hey, um, you know, you funded us for that 100,000. Do you fancy you funding us anymore? Uh, and they said yes, um, which was really cool. So they actually gave us now um, it was 600 and something thousand and then Cure Kids found us and about another 100,000. Uh, and so we basically got enough money for three years, uh, which was a really good amount of money to kind of keep us going, you know, instead of that sort of year to year. So this got us uh, money for uh, Melissa again, for our technician UA, uh, and then we had a few more um, students come on board and start working on that. So this was our kind of phase three, uh, which coincided with the pandemic, um, which has been a bit frustrating. Um, but we made a really good go. So we managed to screen a lot more fungi. We uh, um, screened ones. Um, one of the really cool things is that this collection of fungi has been collected over a long period of time. And so we've been going back into the collection and basically getting them out and then doing some, um, some sequencing to actually identify what they might be. And so we found a whole bunch of stuff that's uh, that's really novel, um, including one that is from a completely new genus as well, which is um, really awesome. So we've got these novel species. Um, uh, and one of the things that we uh, we found was that basically it really matters um, when we screen our fungi and what we grow them in. So this is just showing you a little uh, tree of a small uh, number of the fungi that we've been um, screening. And essentially, each of those, um, those colors is basically the uh, size of a zone of inhibition that these um, fungi produce. And so the greener it is, the more active they are. And what you can see here is that all the different columns are basically the fungi growing on different media. And so there's no like huge pattern, right? There's some fungi are um, active in some media and not others. Um, we've got, there's no one in particular that works. And so what this really taught us is that there's no single condition that we can uh, grow these fungi in. If we want to get their activity, we kind of have to test them in a range of ways, um, which we were not doing before, before we were just sort of growing them in, in one media. Anyway, so that was kind of interesting, um, a little bit frustrating because it kind of meant that everything was sort of uh, kind of expanded, I guess, rather than being able to say, oh, we can just do the screening in this particular way. We kind of had to, if we really wanted to get all the activity, we kind of had to screen them a bit more. Um, one of the things we did find, though, is that our fungi are really active against mycobacteria. So this, again, is just showing you a kind of family tree of our fungi. In this case, they're being screened against two different mycobacteria species, um, Mycobacterium abscessus, which causes abscesses, um, and other really nasty skin infections, actually, um, and Mycobacterium marinum, which is found in water but is used as a surrogate for um, TB, or Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so what you can see here are basically wherever there's gray, that's where a fungus is active against these organisms, and then wherever it's white, um, it's not. And essentially, there was always, almost always a condition that we could find them to be active in um, against these mycobacteria. There were very few fungi that weren't active at all. 
So this was so we were really, really excited about this, that every time we screened them, we would find some activity. So we were super excited to move to the chemistry chemistry stage to find out what is it that they were actually making which is where we got really 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 depressed because it turns out that all these fungi are making a compound called linoleic acid um, and that's basically what is the, uh, causing most of this activity it's well known that this linoleic acid can interfere with the fungi um, sorry with the bacteria's um, they're, so mycobacteria have these amazing kind of fatty acid um, cell walls, and so it interferes with that. Um, so that sort of made us, for, um, I guess, stop screening against mycobacteria because we knew that uh, we would get some activity, but it probably wasn't going to be something interesting. Um, though we do actually have a few novel compounds that we're busy uh, sort of chasing down their structures. So it wasn't a complete waste of time, um, but we certainly got very excited and then a little bit depressed by the fact that it wasn't it wasn't all novel compounds. Um, so we did find a few things. Um, so this is just a couple of papers that we've published um, as part of this work, finding uh, antibacterial things from a few of these um, these uh, fungi. Um, nothing, though, that's going to make it to an actual compound in humans, unfortunately. Um, so that was got us to 2021, where we were running out of money again. And so uh, we continued to write grants, again, still getting nothing. So I went back to New Zealand Carbon Farming and say, said, would you fund us again? Um, and they said, absolutely. And this time gave us a little bit more money. Um, so they gave us enough money uh, to keep Melissa again as a postdoc. Um, this time Alex and Shara had finished their studies and so they um, became technicians. Uh, Judy came on board as a student and Daniel's been doing his PhD. So um, we're in that kind of, uh, yeah, still, so we finished screening actually now, a huge um, number of those um, fungi and we're still trying to identify all the compounds that we've um, found. Um, one of the things we did do, though, as with part of this new fun, uh, funding, was try to make our assays kind of as streamlined as possible. So we've changed from working on petri dishes um, now to working in these 24-well plates, and we do things in both solid and liquid media, uh, again, grow them on different um, media types. Um, but we've also started to try and really um, get much smarter ways of trying to identify the compounds, um, so using things like um, LCMS. And this is where I'm starting to learn a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> as a microbiologist starting to understand more about um, chemistry. Uh, it seems a lot more complicated than I thought it was going to be. Um, but one of the things I want to uh, show you really quickly is um, we have basically, so another one of my passions is Lego. Uh, and we have managed to incorporate Lego um, into our fungi uh, screening project. So there was this really cool paper published a few years ago where they basically made this fraction collector using the Lego Mindstorms. Um, so this is the uh, programmable um, Lego. And so this is a group in the US who are looking for um, active compounds from plants, actually. So they had made this. Uh, they couldn't afford a really uh, expensive fraction collector. And so they made this. Um, they programmed their, their Lego, built this uh, fraction collector that can move um, so basically, you've got you've got the fractions um, like liquid coming out, uh, and this collect, fraction collector moves the your your sort of tip that's dropping all the liquid um, around and into these different um, glass tubes. So we work with much smaller volumes of liquid. So we basically remade this um, this device, but made it so that it can dispense really small amounts of liquid into a 96 well plate. So essentially what we do is when, when we have um, some of our liquid that's come from a fungus that's active, we can run it through um, an LCMS uh, basic machine that essentially um, splits up the uh, kind of, which one does this do? So it basically splits up the kind of compounds that are there uh, and they come through the machine at different times. And so they come through in these little drips and then we basically collect them and uh, move you know, into each of these different wells. And before we built this fraction collector, um, the students were having to sit at the machine and move their plate by hand to kind of collect all these little droplets. And they were getting a bit cross about that. So yeah, so we I raided my Lego collection. We made this um, fraction collector. Uh, and 
this allows us then to basically um, take all those different fractions from the machine and then run them again against our bacteria to see which ones are active. So I'm just going to show you an example of this. So here we've got basically our fractions that have been put through this machine. And here we are testing them um, against three different bacteria. So e. um, Acinetobacter at the top, E. coli and Pseudomonas. And then we are basically looking for changes in light. So if it's green, that means the bacteria are alive. And if it's purple, that means the bacteria are dead. And then we can plate them out to show whether it really is um, dead. And then we can go back to the machine and say what was likely in that droplet that was in that particular well. Um, in this case, we've um, found a compound that's already known called peptamine. Um, but yeah, so we've got hundreds of fungi now that have been screened that were basically going through all of these extracts, putting them through the machine, trying to identify what little droplets they were, the activities in, and then can we identify um, what compounds are there? Or preferably, can we have some uh, compounds that are not known that might be in those droplets? Um, so watch the space, I guess, with this project. Um, so that's our kind of fungi uh, screening project. I just want to talk for the last few minutes about, um, the, I guess, my kind of passion project, the, the project that I've been, um, uh, yeah, I, I've just, I love this one and I won't give it up, even though we can't get it funded. So one of the other really amazing things about bioluminescence or light in general is that it can travel through flesh and skin. And so this means that we can take our glowing bacteria, put them inside of animals and then um, using these really sensitive cameras, uh, see where the bacteria are. So this is just showing you a picture of four mice that have been anesthetized. Um, so they're uh, breathing in basically this gas called isoflurane and they have been infected with a bacterium called Citrobacter rodentium that I made glow in the dark years ago. Um, and it causes, that, so Citrobacter is like a, a basically a, a sort of a, the mouse version of food poisoning E. coli. And so we see this uh, signal in their gut um, because their colons get infected. Uh, and the really cool thing about bioluminescence is that, that, you know, using this technique, we can take the same animal and we can see how the infection progresses. The other way to do this, uh, if you don't have bioluminescence, is to euthanize those animals at, you know, different time points, take out their organs and basically plate them out to look for bacteria. So this is basically showing the same set of animals on day one versus day two, and we can see that the bacteria are kind of growing in number. Uh, we can also see them in the environment. So this is basically glowing mouse poo. And so I said this is like a form of, um, uh, it's like food poisoning bacteria. So these mice are shedding about 100 million bacteria per day each um, into the environment. Uh, and some of the work I did really early on in my postdoc work was to show that if we just take an animal and we put it into this cage, it will basically pick up this bacteria and get infected uh, just by um, either eating the poo, because mice are uh, mice do that, um, or by grooming other animals in the cage. So this really, I guess, um, the fact that we can uh, get this bacteria to, to infect mice um, naturally made me really interested in whether we could use this to study um, pathogen evolution, basically. How can we, can we study how a pathogen changes as it moves from host to host? So um, in 2013, uh, got a little bit, well, applied for a grant, didn't get it, got a little bit of seed funding, uh, and basically started this project wanting to know what makes a bacterium infectious. So my PhD student Hannah and my technician Sarah started this big experiment where we took um, these mice that were infected. So we had um, essentially starting transmission chains. So we uh, orally infected a group of mice and then we split them into individual cages and then we put an animal, a, a, an uninfected animal into each of those cages and allowed the bacteria to transmit from one to the other. And then a week later, we would take the newly infected mouse, put it in a new cage with a new uninfected mouse and allow the bacteria to spread again. And we did this over and over again for um, 20, more than 20 um, hosts in each transmission chain and then basically collected the bacteria at each uh, infection so that we could then uh, freeze them so we could look at how they changed over time. Uh, and so this is just a really complicated drawing, but basically what it shows you is we've got these 10 transmission chains. The, um, the, the 
uh, picture that you can see with all the like squiggly lines that's basically showing you the bacteria being shed from each animal um, as each animal infects each other animal so for each different transmission chain and um, we had a few times where the bacteria didn't transmit and so what we would do is go back to the freezer to the animal before and take those bacteria out and then orally infect the next mouse in the chain and allow it to go on and essentially um, the the sum total of this is that basically the, but there was no real difference in how much the bacteria or the, the animal shed the, the mouse, uh, sorry, the mouse shed the bacteria, um, uh, or um, there was no change in the location. Um, so we were kind of curious as to what what changes might have happened. So there, there, was, there was no change in like the, the bacteria weren't more virulent, more pathogenic, they didn't make the animals more sick. Um, but would there, was there any other change that might have happened? And the big thing we found was that actually um, they became more transmissible. So uh, just as we've seen with the virus that causes um, COVID, uh, basically about eight out of 10 of our transmission chains, the bacteria became more infectious, which was kind of really, really cool and really interesting. And now we're trying to figure out how, <laughs> how did they do that? Um, because it turns out that uh, with viruses, it's actually quite easy. It's mostly things to do with how they interact with their receptor and stuff. Um, bacteria are much more complicated. So there doesn't seem to be one particular thing that they've done. Um, we've had all their genome sequenced. There's nothing that like jumps out as this is the thing that makes them more infectious. Um, so we've uh again we've kind of been writing i've been writing grants for years about this um not really got anywhere uh but because of the pandemic um i now have a little bit of money to spend on this so um i won an award for my science communication work um from the gamma foundation so this was the um it's called the critic and conscience award and that gave me fifty thousand dollars um i convinced the university to give me a little bit of money um, but also people, again, have donated to my lab um, to support this. I've also been giving talks. I've got an agent, and so people have paid to hear me speak, uh, and that's actually given me enough money to fund a postdoc in my lab. So we had Jamila Kester, who uh, joined us last year. Um, she's now gone off and uh, um, actually got a permanent job. Um, so Priscilla has joined us, and we've got a couple of students, and they're basically looking into some of these strains, trying to understand exactly what the genetic changes are and um, how they, um, yeah, what that means for, for how this bacterium became more infectious. Um, watch this space, I guess. Uh, it's all looking kind of exciting, um, but I'm really glad I kind of persevered with this rather than abandoned it back in 2013 when I didn't, you know, get any money for the first time um, because it's very, very cool that it's just been accepted. Um, so our first paper on this work that describes our transmission chains and then using the um, sequencing of the bacteria to study because uh, we know which animal infected which one we're using that um, those genetic sequences to look at whether we can actually track transmission using their genomes and that's just been uh, accepted in nature communications which is pretty cool um, so yeah that's kind of where this is going and hopefully we'll have more information soon on exactly how they changed and became um, more transmissible but I think it's a it's a good story about resilience, this one, and how we can do stuff that even when the funders don't think it's fundable, actually, it's still pretty good science. Um, and if we find a way to do it, <laughs> uh, then, you know, that can be good.